Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Good morning. How are you? Hey, uh, I wanted to let you know I'm wearing uh, Baptist green this morning. Baylor is 6-0 and oh if you're following football, so I thought I'd wear a little Baylor color. And also, not to leave the Catholics out, Notre Dame is... Um, you can sleep on the couch tonight. I can sleep on the couch? <laughs> I, hey, the Baptist beat OSU yesterday, and she's an OSU fan. What can I say? Uh, I, I really didn't mean to wear this today in, in honor of Baylor, but I walked in, and she's like, why are you wearing Baylor colors? And uh, so she's like calling Ken Brumley to set up a counseling session for us, a marriage. So uh, yeah, anyway, um, so welcome to Summit Heights. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Hey, let me tell you this. If you're here for now, you need to stay till the 11, because at 11 o'clock, uh, we're going to do baptism in a horse trough, and uh, I am so stinking excited about this baptism in our next service. Uh, this, uh, uh, my friend Greg is uh, coming to be baptized, and uh, Greg has MS, and so he couldn't get into our other baptism, and so we had a horse trough brought in, because that's a little bit easier for him to get in, and uh, Greg has invited his mama, he's invited his family, and, and I, I am so... Uh, amen. I, I'm so stoked about him uh, professing his faith in Jesus and being obedient. In fact, I want to invite you, as I did last week, if you're wanting to know more about baptism or you have surrendered your life to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but you've never been obedient in baptism, I want to invite you to call us uh, to set up a meeting with one of us, your small group leader, staff, elder, whomever, uh, that you'd like to talk more about that. We would love, love, love to uh, help you be obedient in that, to baptize you. Uh, just out of obedience to let the world know that, hey, I belong to Jesus. So uh, you might stick around for the 11 or go get you something to eat and then come back and, and see my friend Greg get baptized. It's going to be an incredible time. His whole 33 group uh, that he's a part of is going to be helping him. And uh, it's just cool to see that, uh, to see small groups work and men get together and, and happen. So we're in this series on God today. We're going to begin our journey on the seven redemptive names of God. In fact, here's where we're going to be over the next few Few weeks, we're going to be looking at the Lord as my shepherd, the Lord as my provider, the Lord as my healer, the Lord as my righteousness, the Lord as my peace, the Lord as my presence, and the Lord is my banner. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking these names, and, and they're very per personal names. And today, if you have your Bibles, your apps, we're going to be in Psalms 23, that the Lord is my shepherd. And, uh, you know, I, I was telling somebody earlier today that back to the prayer team and then uh, some folks in the hallway. This has been a, a really tough subject because you would think Psalms 23, the most familiar passage probably in scripture outside of John 3, 16, should be easy to preach through. The problem with Psalms 23 is it's just loaded. I mean, it's absolutely loaded with some of the richest texts I've, I've probably waded through in a long time and, and maybe of all time. And I think what's interesting to me is, is that we live in a culture that things change quickly. It seems like a song will come out and that's the big thing or, or, or a movie will come out and that's the latest, greatest thing. But it seems like the more, uh, the longer I, I look at this, our culture changes so quick and, and what's big yesterday is not big today. What was big last week is not big anymore. And, and I think through all this, but one of the things I know is that it seems like Psalms 23 just sticks around. There's something about this song, there's something about this song uh, that, that there's something true in the human, human experience that, 
that kind of transcends culture, it transcends time. And I think for many of us, there's an attraction to this psalm and, and we see it at funerals and we see it when people die and there, there's something in us that we hope that this is true. There's something in us when we read Psalms 23, we want God to be like that. And yet, there's some of us, maybe in this room, or maybe listening by Facebook or listening on TV this week, that you're not sure. And you hear it over and over again, and you've seen it, and you'll go to a funeral, and you'll read it on the back, and, and you'll see that there. But the problem is that many of us don't feel this way. And things come and go. You see it in TV shows. You see it on, the, you hear it on the radio. In fact, I was going through, looking through how many uh, artists use this passage or the imagery of this passage. And Kanye West has a song called Jesus Walks or Coolio, Gangster's Paradise, where he talks about this in there. And, and the U2 song, Love Rescue Me, or Pink Floyd has that song, Sheep. And I looked this one up just for my wife because she's a Grateful Dead uh, fan, and I'm not. I've never quite understood the Grateful Dead and all that stuff. But they have a song called Ripple, where it talks about Psalms 23. So it's not just the church that holds on to this. It's, it's all of culture that, that grabs onto this. And this several-year, thousand-year-old song, Psalm just resonates in our soul. Presidents and world leaders, when tragedy and war comes on, they go to this passage because there's something in it that just almost we go, I want this to be real. Could it be that God really is like that? Because I know some of you have been walking with God for a long time, and very honestly, you're not sure you even believe this. You're not sure that He really is a shepherd. You're, you're not even real sure that he shows up because it's been so long since, quote unquote, you feel like he has shown up in your journey that you wonder if he really is or where he is. So today we want to look at that first redemptive name of God. It's a relator name. Remember, we looked at those foundational names that God is a creator God, he's the Elohim, that God is the relator God, that he is Jehovah, and God is the uh, uh, owner, the Adonai. He owns everything. And we love the creator God, and we love the relator God. As I said last week, we don't always appreciate the owner God, that he wants to own all of us. And, and by the way, he does own all of us because he's purchased us with Jesus. Amen? We're talking about those of us who believe. And so as we look at this Hebrew poetry in Psalms 23 where David's writing, he's inviting us into the narrative that, that, that kind of wrap our hearts and our minds around because David was a shepherd. And so a lot of this imagery is what he was looking at and what he was uh, understanding. And it's a very personal uh, uh, view of God. And David is relating to Jehovah when it says, the Lord is my shepherd. The word Lord is that relator, that Jehovah. And remember I told you that all the relator, all the uh, redemptive names of God point back to to the foundational names of God. And so we see here that, that, that David is writing back and he's, he's referring back to that whole relator God. And we're going to see in just a moment where we also understand that he is the Adonai, that he is also the creator God, because we see that in all of the shepherd imagery that he has. And it's kind of an overflow of David's experience with him. Of all the names that we're going to look at, we see this, this self-revealing one that, that, that the Lord is revealing himself, that, that David's relating to him. But this word shepherd, this title shepherd literally means to tend, to pasture, to shepherd. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to do something a little bit different. In fact, I want to go ahead and tell you what we're going to do at the very end of the service today because we're going to do something completely different. Out of our norm, at the end of our service today, we're going to close after we've taken communion, after we've responded and everything, we're going to close by reciting the Lord's Prayer together as we leave. But today I want us to do something also together. There's something powerful about what I believe we're going to do in just a moment is in Psalms 23, I want us to read this together out loud. Can we do that? It's kind of that response. It's kind of when, when God's people join together, there's something powerful in that. There's something powerful that when we join together to read those things that I don't really understand it all, but I know that God just kind of shows up. So can we read this together this morning? Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. Come on. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, people look at a lot of things to take care of them, don't they? Money. They'll look at power. They'll even look for relationships. And when relationships end, it's like their life is devastated. Because we're always looking for something to shepherd us, aren't we? Some of us use success to prop us up and, and money to kind of prop us up and give us power or give us position. And, but I think the worst of all things that we do to shepherd ourselves is we trust in ourselves. And isn't that weird? How we will trust ourselves over the one who created us. In other words, uh, last week we learned the owner, the Adonai, the one who owns it all, all, including us, that he takes responsibility for us. And yet, even though we know he takes responsibility for us, we still will try to take responsibility for ourselves, won't we? We'll still try to prop ourselves up. I love what David says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I want you to notice the tense of that, that is the present tense. It's not the Lord was my shepherd. It's not even the Lord is going to be my shepherd. And David is starting off, and it's so personal. It's, a, it's, it's personal to him. It's not we. It's not us. It's I. It's me. And he looks at this, and he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Not that I'm going to get my life right down the road. Not that me and God's got a deal, and we're going to make that on my deathbed. No. Today, David is declaring the Lord is my shepherd. It's in the present tense that he is going to take care of me, that he's very personal, and that God has stepped right into the middle of tending to David. He's not only interested in the group, but I want you to notice that David says that God is interested in him. It's a very personal visual. The Lord is my shepherd. And he is a right now God. It's not a God that I gotta wait for next week or a God I gotta wait for next Sunday or I gotta wait till the 11 o'clock gym before I can get God. No, he's a right now God. And he wants to show up now. Even when you don't feel like it, even when it doesn't seem like it, that he is a shepherd that is tending. And you see, for us to realize that he's a shepherd, we gotta realize we're a sheep, right? I'm telling you, pastors say some of the dumbest things. I'm so glad I'll never do that, Amen. <laughs> But I have said this before, and this last week as I've been studying, sometimes when you say stupid things, they wind up being repeated and never forgotten. <laughs> anyway, I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> one of the statements I've heard, and I've been guilty of saying that sheep are dumb. Pastors say that all the time in referencing to the church, that sheep are dumb. The problem with that is, is that it's really about an issue for some pastors to control their church. For others, it's just not being aware that what we're doing when we say that sheep are dumb and we're saying that the sheep is the church, right? What we're saying is that God's creation that he declared very good in the image of God is dumb. Oh. I remember this last week as I began to really unpack this passage and Danielle and I talked about it several times at night as we would sit on the back porch and sit in the garage and we had our visits and we would talk and that I was struggling with this because sheep really are dumb, amen? I mean, the animal. The problem is we got to be careful that we don't disrespect what God called good. And so we've got to understand if we need a shepherd then we are sheep. Sheep are not dumb. Sinful, yes. Dumb, no. Sinful, yes. Dumb, no. Stubborn, yes. Amen? Stubborn. Dumb, no. In fact, sheep are not dumb, and they can remember over 50 faces for over two years. Can you? <laughs> yeah, see what I'm saying? All of a sudden, it changes, doesn't it? In fact, sheep will try to find their way out of a pasture to get to greener pastures, sometimes out of rebellion of not staying where they are. They're not dumb. Innocent, yes. Stubborn, yes. Dumb, no. In fact, what we learned is that 
if we don't think of ourselves as sheep, then we won't ever experience all there is to experience in Jesus being our shepherd. In fact, shepherds don't tend wolves or dogs. Shepherds tend sheep. And you're smart. Listen to me, church. You're smart. And you are made in the image of God. And that means that you have something to offer. Some of you believe that you don't have anything to offer. Or maybe you've sinned too much. Or maybe you've been stubborn too long. Listen, you were made in the image of God, so therefore you can now live in that image and out of that image, but underneath the shepherd, the one who takes care of us. See, sheep are innocent. They're not dumb. Sheep aren't harmful creatures. They're harmless and peaceful. In fact, Christians by their nature should be peaceful. We should be peacemakers, amen? Sheep are meek. They're meek as I was reading this last week, I went back to the 16th century. Thomas Watson, that great Puritan pastor, described the good shepherd, and he said six things about sheep. Number one, sheep are innocent. They're not dumb. Number two, sheep are meek. They're creatures who know their place, and they willingly submit to a shepherd that's good. There's some that, that wander off, because Jesus talks about that one who wanders off, but for the most part, sheep will stay together. Sheep are clean and unclean at the same time. Sheep look for green pastures. They look for clean water. The problem is many sheep along the way following the shepherd will stop and compromise for less water than what the shepherd has for them. And many times they're not clean because their wool is so thick and they, and they collect dirt and they're not able to clean themselves. So they're both clean and yet unclean. It's kind of like us today. We are clean because of what Jesus Christ has done, but we're unclean because we still live in the world today. Amen? We're very much like sheep. Sheep are useful. Every part of the sheep is useful. I didn't know this is meat, it's wool, it's skin. They're all offered up for the good of others. In a similar way, the whole life of a believer. For those of us who claim to know Jesus Christ, he says, you're my sheep and I'm your shepherd. So our whole life should be beneficial as we're about to see in just a moment. But I love this when sheep are content. As Watson says, the sheep will feed upon any pasture where you put it. And there are some sheep that, sh that graze in great green pastures and they flourish. And there are other sheep that don't have really good shepherds and you know about this. But the problem is they will stay right where they are. You see, sheep are content, but they're also fearful. They're easily scared and skittish. Sheep are very feel for, fearful if any danger approaches. They recognize the dangers around them. But here's what's so awesome about sheep is they will trust the shepherd to protect them, to guard them, and to guide them. So if we're sheep, then shouldn't we be careful in selecting our shepherds? Think about that for a minute. When we're selecting a shepherd, which by the way, we all do. Some of you have chosen that shepherd of money, but all your security is wrapped up in what's in your banking account. That all your security is wrapped up in your job. That all of your security is wrapped up in that relationship, that helm, that her, may, maybe that, that child that, that you hope will never leave the house. And there's something wrong with you to think that your child will never leave the house. Amen? Because we raised them to leave. Amen? That doesn't mean they can't come back and they can't stay, and, but their room's going to be an office. Okay? <laughs> Sleep on a hide of bed. Some of us have chosen shepherds that are not healthy. Some of us have chosen addiction to shepherd us. Because at night we can't go to sleep or maybe during the day we can't cope or we can't wait to get home to pour that little glass of happiness, amen? And it shepherds us through the night and it shepherds us through the day. We must be careful about which shepherds we choose because you choose the wrong one and you'll suffer. You choose the one willing to lay down your life for you. You choose a shepherd that's willing to lay his life down. Jesus said this in John 10 and 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If what you've chosen will not lay its life down for you, then you have not chosen a good shepherd. You have not chosen a good shepherd. Now, let's look how David just masterfully showed us. The shepherd in Psalms 23, he says that I shall not want. In other words, the good shepherd who tends us has covered all our needs. He has comprehensively covered everything that we need. When we're talking to potential elders here at Summit, because we're an elder-led church, we have shepherds, shepherds that lead us. We always go back and we show them what it means to be a shepherd. And one of the ways we show them what it means to be a shepherd is to show them what it means to be a bad shepherd. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 2 and 4, look at it. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Hello. 
prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds. In other words, you guys are bad at shepherds. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not sheep take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So we see a picture of here of what not to do, but we also see that it's the role of the shepherd to feed, to strengthen, to heal, to bind up the broken, to bring back those who are lost, to seek the lost. And so God lays out in a very negative term what a shepherd is to do. But what we see from that negativity is we see exactly what God expects of shepherds. And by the way, of what he offers to us. That he is feeding us if we're willing to eat. That he is strengthening us. That he would heal us. That he would bind us. He would bring back. He would seek you. By the way, he is much more present than you are. Let me say that again. Jesus is much more present than you are right now. You may not feel it. You may not look like it. It may not look like your situation has any hope in it. But he's present because he's a good shepherd. He's present because he's in that moment. So when David says that the shepherd, the Lord has met all of his needs, he's referring to a whole lot of needs, is he not? I mean, think about you. You need direction. I need direction. I need food. I need healing. I need sick seeking. He needs to come after me. I need defense, and he needs to clean me up, and he needs to, to, to help me. I depend on him. I'm a needy dude. I remember when I was, I was uh, going through my, my Berkman analysis with my, uh, my executive coach that I hired a couple of years ago. And, and, and the Berkman analysis, what it shows is your needs. And when your needs are met, then you will flourish and you'll be energized. So I remember when I was sitting down with Nathan a couple of years ago and we were sitting in his house there in Tulsa and, and I was going through this test. I kept going through, this is a need, this is a need, this is a need. And finally he goes, dude, you're like one of the neediest people I've ever met. And I was like, really? Dang. I said, is that bad? Because, I mean, is anybody like to hear you're needy? I mean, you're needy, dude. You're needy. Oh, I know you. You're really needy. I'm needy. I need a shepherd. I'm telling you, left to myself, I am in trouble. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. So many of us have lost our passion and our fire. Do you remember that? Maybe it was last summer at youth camp. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was 10 years ago. You lost that passion, and there's not rest Maybe you've wandered away and you're lost and and you're trying to figure out how to get your way back. And this ache inside of you is reminding you this morning as you hear about this shepherd, there's something in you. You go, could it be real? Is this really what God's like? Because that aching inside of you, I love what David says here, that the shepherd restores our soul. That there should be rest. One One of the hallmarks of a follower of Jesus Christ should be that we are at rest. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Sometimes he even puts us in situations where we have no other option but to lay down. Remember raising toddlers? Some of you are still there. I'm praying for you, amen. And every afternoon, you take them in and you're gonna lay them down for a nap. Oh, bless the Lord, right? And it seems like the cruelest thing you could ever do to a toddler, doesn't it? Because they well and scream and no, I don't want to lay down and no, mama, you don't like me and no, daddy and all the wailing and all that. But here's what we know. If we can just get them still enough, long enough, they'll pass out. Amen. Amen. Now you may have the one that doesn't. We will pray for you after the service. Come to the front and we'll lay hands on you. Amen. So I'm just telling you, for most, all right, I don't want to make a blanket statement because for most of us, we know if we just get still, we'll rest. We tell young mothers that when your baby naps, you nap because you need it. It's rest. Have you considered that perhaps God hadn't changed your situation or your circumstance because he's waiting for you to relinquish control? He's waiting for you to lie down. 
Some of you are in a situation that you can't figure out and, and you keep striving and you keep trying to manipulate and you keep trying to go around and yet all God's saying is, it looks on, I'm the shepherd. I, I'm gonna let you lay down. And you can fight me all you want to, but I'm gonna leave you there till you rest because one of the hallmarks of someone who has a good shepherd is that they rest and they're at rest. We live in a culture that you ask people when they go to bed at night, oh, I'm tired. And when they wake up, the moment they wake up, they go, oh, I'm tired. There's something wrong with that. I remember I was reading that this last week and I thought, that's me. Oh, that's not good. Ask 10 people today when you leave. Now, they won't say it now because I've already warned them. <laughs> hey, how you doing? I'm worn out. I'm so tired, right? Because we're just programmed. And listen, one of the hallmarks of someone who has a good shepherd is they rest. And they submit underneath that. He leads us beside quiet waters. Sheep are not sure-footed. They won't, <clears throat> they won't drink from moving water. In fact, the sheep, because they're so full of wool and, and they're not sure-footed, if there's moving water, they will spend all their time trying to stay afoot because they know if they fall over and the wool gets wet, they're going to drown. And so they won't drink from moving water. And how many times are we trying to drink from society today that never stops, that what's popular today will be gone tomorrow, what, what we're surfing today won't surf tomorrow. And all the things that we do as we're trying to drink in life from a moving water that, that literally we can't. Because when we rest in him, here's what God does. He leads us into environments that refresh us. He will lead us to environments. That we, and listen, if you're in an environment where there's moving water, let me tell you what the shepherd will do. The shepherd will go out and build a dam and create the quiet water where you can drink. Oh, come on, man. He wants us to realize, and this is, this is incredible, because as long as you drink from power, as long as you're drinking from that relationship, thinking she's going to fix you, or he's going to fix you, or sex is going to fix you, or a drink is going to fix you, or money's going to fix you, or power's going to fix you, or, or yourself is going to fix you. Listen, he wants you to realize that if he doesn't restore your soul, nothing will. If God doesn't restore you, nothing will. As long as you, start, you stay in rebellion and you argue and you kick and you scream and you're that toddler, no! He'll let you, but he loves you, and he'll guide you. He says he'll guide us in the paths of righteousness. You see, shepherds need to guide sheep because sheep are prone to wonder. One of my favorite hymns, prone to wonder, Lord, I know how easy it is for me with my ADD and my OCD and all my other initials. Anybody got a bunch of them? Anybody want to make a confession? Liars. Anyway. How easily distracted I am. This is crazy. I was reading this last week. They, I don't know this is true because I honestly, I, I mean, I was in donkey basketball last night and I was more scared of the donkeys than the donkeys were of me. I'll just make that honest confession, okay? And so um, I, I've never been around sheep. I've never been on a sheep farm, but they tell me that if one sheep gets up and starts walking in circles and another sheep gets up and starts walking in circles, the whole herd will get up and start walking in circles and they will walk in circles thinking they're going somewhere. I want to see that. I just, I, I do. I want to see that. Amen. And see, here, here's the damning thing of that. I do see that every day. I see the church of Jesus Christ where one loud voice gains a following and the church has been wondering. In fact, in fact I think there was a picture in the Old Testament. I don't know. I could be wrong. The Exodus where they walked in circles, a bunch of sheep. Amen. See, some of us are walking in circles. We're not walking along those paths of righteousness. Yet God, our shepherd, wants to direct us in those right paths that every decision, that he's willing to do that on the front end if we'll seek him. That if we'll seek him, he'll, he'll take us down those paths that lead to lush, green, and water, and clean. If we'll let him lead us. 
David then talks about valleys and shadows, a rod and a staff, that a valley is a low place between two mountains. It's a place of vulnerability and risk. In fact, those shepherds used to take their sheep from the lowlands in the summer, and they would take them up into the highlands during the winter. And in order to do that, to those best plateaus, those tabletops, they had to go through valleys to get to them. And, and so many times it's in the valleys is where clean water is and lushness and great food, but there's also where the predators are. It's a place of vulnerability. It's a place of risk. And even though the valleys are inevitable in all of our lives, there's good news. A valley reminds us that there's another mountain ahead, amen? Anytime you're in a valley, be reminded that there's a mountain coming up, amen? And a valley is a place of lush, clean water because all the mountain snow is melting off and it's creating these beautiful pastures and that clean water. So many times when we're in the valley, see sheep have a tendency when they get into a valley, they think it's night because the shadows cast across. You know what a sheep does when it thinks it's night? They lay down and go to bed. How novel. <laughs> How novel would that be in America today, amen? They just lay down. And so the shepherd has to guide them along the path. This beautiful picture of the shepherds guiding along the path because the shepherd goes before and the shepherd's preparing that path. And if he sees poisonous weeds, he pulls those weeds because he knows that those sheep will eat those weeds because the shepherd's taking care of them. And he's gathering up all along the way. And all along the way, as those sheep are trodden through that ground, they're creating mud holes. And so they guide those sheep to go past those mud holes because the sheep will stop and drink thinking that's the cleanest water he's going to find. All along, the shepherd has still waters up ahead. And so he keeps moving them along in the pasture land. So many of us have stopped because we're eating just whatever's in front of us, not letting the, pie, not letting the shepherd prepare. We're just drinking from whatever hole we come from, be it success, be it relationships, be it money, be it power, be it an addiction, that we're just drinking from any hole that comes along that so many others have tried through. And we know that, don't we? And we still stop and drink. Oh, I'll be the exception. I'll get away with it. Because he'll never find out. She'll never find out. And listen, what I'm doing ain't hurting anybody. Because nobody knows. How many men and women through the years have drank from that same dirty hole? Thought they were going to get away with it. And all along, the shepherd is coming along going, come on, son. Come on, baby girl. I love you. You're my daughter. Come with me. I I I've got pastures for you. I've got water waiting for you. Don't, don't, don't drink from that one. Don't. Please don't do that. I've got so much more. David says, even though I walk through the valley, he says, I don't sit down in the valley. I don't sit down and whine in the valley. I walk through the valley. You know what many of us do? We sit down and whine when bad things happen, don't we? Why me? Don't I, can I ever get a break? They're always getting to go on vacation. Yeah, they're up to debt in their eyeballs, amen? Not everybody. Don't send me an email. See, we don't know the whole story. We'll sit down in a valley and whine. David says, no, I'm going to pass through. I'm going to pass through. Shepherds keep the sheep moving even though they're afraid. As the shadows seem to close in, they keep following the shepherd. When God allows us to be in the valley of shadows, when things are dark and you want to give up, remember, God does some of his best work in the dark. Do you know that? Remember a couple of weeks ago, we said that even when we sleep, God works? Isn't that amazing? And he is a creator God. He's in complete control. He's the owner God, that he owns it all, but he's a relator God, that even when he says, I'm going to let you sleep, he's working it out. God does some of his best work in the dark. At the darkest point in history, God did his best work that when we were separated from him and there was no way you and I could ever be made right, he did his best work in the dark by sending Jesus into a dark world. Isn't that incredible? That in the darkest point in history, Galatians says that in the fullness of time, Jesus, God sent Jesus, born of a woman, born in the law. It was the, it was the appointed time. God's timing is perfect, by the way. Somebody needs to hear that. God's timing's perfect. It may look like it's dark, but listen, God does his best work in the dark. Because in the darkest point in history, God sent Jesus. And Jesus took our sins. 
And he took our sins upon us, the sins that separated us from him. And he died and became the sacrifice. But three days later, he rose again on that dark day when those disciples were gathered in that upper room wondering what happened. Have we followed a lie? I thought he was the shepherd. I thought he was going to do it. I thought he was going to overthrow Rome. And three days later, he knocked on the door. Come on. And any one of us that will surrender in a personal relationship to him, he says, we'll be saved. We'll be rescued. Oh, come on, man. Really? Is that the best you got? We'll be rescued. He'll snatch us out. And when we realize his tending and his shepherding, we begin to understand his presence, that God's been tending and shepherding from the beginning. He says, a table and oil and an overflowing cup, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I would so much rather God destroy my enemies. Amen? Anybody else with me on that? Yeah. I read that. I was listening to Louis Giglio preach on the table of my enemies this last week while I was working out, and, and Louis made the comment, well, no wonder you can be at peace with the shepherd if God would destroy everything. Because that's what I want. Mess with me, God's going to strike you. Go on. You want some of this? <laughs> David's writing, dealing with physical needs here. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. That he's talking about these, these physical needs, that enemies are a threat to our security, that enemies show up in people and things, and certainly the devil and his demons. We know that. Yet David assures us that when the enemy shows up, that God shows up and prepares a table in front of them. Because he doesn't submit to the enemy. He's not subject to the enemies of your life. Remember, he's the creator God. He's the owner God, but he's the relator God. And because he's the relator God, he owns it all. He's not subject to anything, not even your enemy, not even your mother-in-law, not even your ex-wife, not even your ex-husband, not even your ex-boss, not even whatever. He's not subject to anyone. So he can prepare a table anywhere he wants to, Amen. The shepherd used to carry this towel on his belt, and when a little sheep would run off and get lost, because that's what we do, and he would find that little sheep. Sometimes they would go into the thorns looking for that fresh grass, and their little head would be cut up. And the shepherd sometimes would have to take that rod or that staff and, and pull it in and pull that sheep out, creating even more tears on its head and its body. In the presence of the enemy, Shepherd would take that towel, he would lay it out on the grass, he'd pull some fresh grass, and he would put it on the towel, and he would invite the sheep to come and eat. And the sheep knew in the presence of the shepherd that nothing would threaten him, that nothing would threaten him. What an incredible picture. That when we come to the one who wants to feed us, there's absolutely nothing that could threaten us. Because he's our shepherd. When the sheep eats in the safety of the shepherd, the enemy has to keep its distance. You see, fundamental to our understanding of God is, as our shepherd, is the realization that the Lord himself is the one that's preparing a table for you right now. Right now, in the presence that we can be safe that your addiction today does not have to rule you if you'll drink and you'll eat of what the shepherd's offering. God's not subject to our enemies. And while resting and eating and feeding on the word of God, those sheep who has wandered away, when the shepherd retrieves that sheep from the thicket, I love this picture because he would carry oil. He'd carry oil and, and that oil would have certain spices in it and, and different parts and pieces in that. And when that little sheep was eating and that head was bleeding, he would pull out his oil, pour it in, and he would massage it into its head. My son, the other night at the football game, down in Cushing, Texas, sat behind me and massaged my head. Oh, oh, man, it was good. I'm telling you. I mean, it's like, like an old dog laying out there in the yard, man. And he kept saying, Dad, your head's greasy. I'm like, you'll be old someday, son. It's okay. You know, and he would just massage it. I was like, oh, man, it was good. It was just a reminder 
that even when our wounds, that God takes the anointing oil and he soothes it. And my cup runneth over. You know, there's two views of that cup. And one is a good view and the other is a really tough one to swallow. Because one is, think fishers and loaves. Every time Jesus comes along, he multiplies and he gives us more than we could ever handle. But you also have to realize in Scripture that the cup that Jesus talked about was the cup that you and I could not drink. The cup of suffering. Now, church, listen to me. <laughs> None of us like to think about suffering, do we? None of us think, want to drink of that cup. In fact, Jesus says, you don't even get it. Because you can't drink of it. And so when David talks about my cup runneth over, he is not saying that my cup runneth over and trouble will never come my way. There is two pictures in Scripture here of the cup. One is suffering, one is an abundance. And the church today has decided that they don't want suffering, and so that's where the, the, the prosperity gospel has come from. That's where many of the TV preachers that we see today on TV have decided that there's not a cup of suffering anymore. The problem is you cannot find that in the new covenant. There is a suffering. There is a refiner's fire in the Old Testament. Because you see, God will even allow us when we refuse to lay down for that suffering to mold us. And David says that he, it says my cup runneth over. Listen to here. God knows how to soothe you with anointing oil. And listen to me. He's either going to administer a solution or he's going to give you peace. He's either going to administer a solution or he's going to give you peace to sustain you while you're in the problem. See, some of you just want out of the problem. Daddy, just solve it for me. And sometimes the best thing daddy can do is let you solve the problem and him give you peace to mold you. Aren't you glad you came? Because we're sheep, aren't we? And we need a shepherd. And my cup overflows, but my favorite part will close. Goodness, loving kindness in the house of God. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David wraps up this whole song. He could have said any other word than surely, maybe, perhaps, hopefully, because that's what we say, isn't it, when we talk about God? Maybe God, hopefully God. If no, David says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. What follows you? What follows you? I, I think that would be an incredible fact. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm going to be posting some questions about what follows you. They're great questions I've been asking them myself this morning. That when I leave a room, what follows me? People glad he left? When I leave a meeting, are they just really glad it's over? Or am I leaving goodness and mercy? Oh, come on, church. See, when we're being led by the shepherd, goodness and mercy, follow us. And what you leave behind is what's evident of what's being led. What you leave behind. David didn't waver in his belief. He was certain two things, goodness and loving kindness, will be present to God and direct us, but it'll also leave a wake behind us. The result is peace when we dwell in the house. That when we know the power of Jehovah Ra, we discover that God's able to meet all of our needs. And goodness, mercy, and loving kindness will follow us. What follows you? Honestly, when you leave, do people say he's arrogant? She's self centered. She's narcissistic. She is a black hole. <laughs> Not looking at anybody. These lights are so bright. <laughs> Goodness and mercy. I think the thing that's overwhelmed me this week is how do you talk about something so rich and so deep in 37 minutes or left or less? And there's not. Because the shepherd is good and he wants to lead you. Have you submitted to him? as a dependent sheep. Would you be willing? See, it's an issue of ownership, the shepherd. The shepherd owns the sheep. That's why he pursues the sheep and feeds the sheep. 
That's why the sheep follow the shepherd. There's just so much I could go on here this morning. But the question comes into you is have you submitted to the sheep or the shepherd to repent and confess that the little shepherds in your life are leading you to destruction? And that's why you stand at the fence and look at other pastures thinking, I wish I could get over there. Well, listen, as long as you're under the power of that little shepherd, until you submit to the good shepherd, Jesus, and you're just going to eat of the wasteland, would you be willing to submit this morning and confess that as sin and allow him to massage and anoint your head with the healing oil of forgiveness? Listen, until we do, you're going to continue walking and resting and laying down in the shadows, hoping nobody sees and hoping nobody knows. But the good shepherd is looking for you, and he's inviting you today to rest. Amen? Let's pray together. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I know so many times we preachers talk about these big subjects. And you may be sitting here wondering today, how do we allow him to shepherd us? I mean, come on, Edward, really, what's that look like? <clears throat> let, me, let me say this to you. It's a simple matter of faith and acceptance. In fact, with every head bowed and every head closed, you remember when you got saved? You remember how you got saved? You got saved by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You got saved by submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he now owns you. Just as we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save us and to come into our life, to give him complete control, so we invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and shepherd us daily. And just by faith we believe and we know and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior who saves us from our sin it's by that same faith, listen to me, it's by that same faith that also keeps us from sin. It's like when Superman rescued that lady and he had her way up in the sky and he's flying across the sky and she panics and he asks her, what's going on? She goes, what if I fall? He goes, you mean you trust me to save you and you think I'm going to get all the way up here and drop you? <laughs> And God's saying, you think I can't sustain you? Would you be willing to submit to that today? For our own good, many of us refuse and resist, and yet he owns you. And so he's going to come along beside you with that rod and that staff, and he's going to tap on the side of you and say, come on, come on. Would you be willing this morning? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray and we're going to respond. We're going to respond a couple ways. One, we're going to take communion. There's two tables at the front, two in the back. But I also want to invite you this morning that maybe before you go and eat at the table prepared for you. By the way, he prepared that table too by dying for us. <laughs> Isn't that good? He prepared that table too by dying for us. It's not something flippant we do every week. It's powerful that he invites us to come and eat and to drink in remembrance of him. So maybe before you do that this morning, maybe you need to come to this altar or grab one of these prayer warriors and say, would you pray for me? Because I need to surrender some things in my journey. I've got some little shepherds that I need to get rid of. And this morning, you just be bold enough to surrender to that and repent. Maybe you've never surrendered to the shepherd, Jesus, and you need to get saved and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this morning we invite you to do that and then respond with communion. And we come back together, we're gonna to pray out together the Lord's Prayer. So let's stand, stand together. Lord, I love you. Thank you this morning that we can follow the Good Shepherd and respond. Father, may you receive glory from what we do this morning, I love you. And we ask it in your strong, powerful name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Let's respond together. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.